Hello, my name is Philip Plotch, and I'm the principal researcher here at the Eno Center for Transportation. Welcome to the latest in our series of webinars. Eno is an independent, nonpartisan, and nonprofit think tank that shapes public debate on multimodal transportation issues and builds a network of transportation professionals. Today, we're going to discuss strategies to improve retail at bus and train stations. It's a topic important to transit users, transit agencies, and everyone who wants to promote transit use. We have three very talented people joining us today. Susan Fine is an urban planner and real estate attorney. She has her own consulting firm, and she's led numerous real estate projects, including the renovation of New York City's Grand Central Terminal, which became a model for transit retail around the world. Charlie DiMaggio, also an urban planner and real estate attorney, is CEO of Greystone Management Solutions. It's a firm that provides a wide range of real estate services, including leasing space on behalf of transit agencies. Laura Barr is a self-described urban planning nerd. She's our senior vice president at CBRE, and she leads a team based in California that works with a wide range of commercial developers and retailers. Susan and then Charlie and Laura are each going to have a five-minute presentation, and then we're going to open this up for questions. You can enter your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen at any time, and we'll get to as many as possible. Eno is happy to offer our webinar series free of charge. If you're interested, interested in supporting our work, you can check out the link in the chat box to donate or to become a member. You can find slides and a recording of the webinar on our website, enotrans.org. The recording will also be emailed to all the registrants within a day. And with that, here's Susan. Thank you, Phil. Um, so let's start. And let's go to my first slide, please. So um, you may think this is a little nuts. Uh, I, early in my career, I was director of real estate at the MTA, and I conceived and implemented the renovation of Grand Central Terminal. And that was a project that was largely led by the retail, the, recent, the way in which the financing worked, which we, was, well, we were able to create the fiction of capitalizing uh, a rent stream that was going to generate $200 million of revenue. So fast forward to, I guess, about 2010, and this dark, dank, ugly corridor in the roadbed of 8th Avenue, was, which had never been able to be leased, was put up by RFP for, by the NASA Metropolitan Transportation Agency, and with my partners, we were able to create the first privatization of a corridor uh, in New York, uh, in, the, in the subway system, which as you, I'm sure you know, it's the largest transportation agency uh, in the country. Uh, so let's continue with the next slide, please. So why did I do it? Um, I had studied transit retail around the country and didn't really understand why we couldn't do what Seoul and other places had done. And I had learned a lot of lessons um, at from doing Grand Central. I think I had learned what customers want and how to create stores that retailers, and particularly small local retailers, could afford. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this as was, as I said, the first public-private partnership that the MTA had ever entered into, and it was tough. Um, why? Uh, the, central the central challenge, I think, that we faced is that every transit agency wants to move riders on time and safely. Any operator, and certainly all of my stores, needed to make a living. They were investing off in their life savings. Synthesizing those two, uh, those two issues was not an easy thing to do. Um, so that the public-private partnerships um, have a couple of advantages. One is we didn't have to we didn't have to RFP spaces. We could didn't have to take the tenant that was going to pay the highest rent. We could take that tenant which was going to best serve riders. So just a couple of points before. Uh, I'm handed over to Charlie, a, a couple of t pointers for all of you. So let's go to the next one, please. Um, transit retail has changed. You'll hear more about this. And it's really, really important to reconceive it as an amenity 
rather than you can see how many fewer people we have today than we used to have, then as a profit center for transit agencies, it will bring your customers back. Next, please. Um, you got to know your customer. Mistakes I had made was that I was too high end. Everybody rides the, the subway. Everybody takes buses. You got to go high and low. And next slide. Tell your operator the rules where transit agencies make a mistake and where the retail isn't as beautiful as turnstile turned out is where the operator, i.e. me and my stores, which there's 40 first gen businesses, don't know what they need to do to get open. Um, but the good news is we were a success. And here's my last uh, brag. Um, this is us. Some of our stores are still there. There's a lot of female owned businesses. There's a lot of um, first gen businesses. We're coming back slowly and surely from the pandemic and uh, the riders love us. And it is the riders who shop with us. So with that, Charlie, um, I take, I, I turn the baton to you. Thanks, Sue. And, um, you know, honestly, if many people are familiar with your, what happened at Grand Central Terminal, and how much of that's a jewel of many of the systems and a, you know, everybody's goal to try to have a retail market that looks like Grand Central Terminal. Uh, but if you haven't had an opportunity, if you find yourself in New York to see Sue's work at Turnstile, that's where really much more creative and, and really a, a, a unique experience because it's one that's below grade. And, and to try to have that vision to see what she's been able to produce, it's really worthwhile if you find yourself in the Columbus Circle area that get below grade and take a look at what Turnstile is trying to do. Um, John, you could just flip the slide when you get a chance. What I want to try to do to kind of connect uh, both Sue and, and Laura's presentation is really from a high level to find some attributes and issues and definitions about transit realty. Because um, as Sue mentioned, it's changing in terms of what we think retail is and, and transit retail is. And to a lot of people, it's an amenity for a ride of experience. Um, hopefully for the, the transportation agencies, they view it as non fair box revenue. And, you know, certainly with the scope and size of something like Turnstile Grand Central, it does become a contributor to a revenue. Um, but also when we start talking about transit realty in our world, we're also talking about the type of retail that's available for transit oriented development. And as more and more TOD projects become uh, into fruition and more agencies and municipalities require transit agencies to set aside for affordable housing or other public amenities, uh, parts of that TOD site, they need to develop revenue sources in the capital stack uh, includes re retail, retail that not just services transit passengers, but the mixed use community that e people are trying to develop on the different sites. Of course, it is an asset to increase ridership. And I would, I would say to you that what Sue has done down at Turnstile becomes an attractor to ridership, you know, and the destination point unto itself. When we look at transit realty, one of the important things to think about is, is it a transit stop or a destination to itself? And how are you attracting people from outside the commuting world uh, as, as a potential customer? I would say Turnstile does, and so does Grand Central Terminal. But if you go to the platform in Bayside Station, Long Island Railroad, that's a commuter amenity. And it's a commuter station. That's not a destination point. And it's important when you, in terms of what you're able to build and what kind of revenue you can produce. Um, go ahead, John, flip that slide. The reality is that there are a lot of hurdles to achieve the kinds of things that we try to produce. Um, clearly, and I think, Sue, you might agree, the difference between Grand Central and Turnstile is it's below grade. And once you go below grade to construct something, expenses just quadruple. They quadruple because you need flagmen. They quadruple because insurance rates themselves, something called railroad protective insurance kicks in. Um, <laughs> All kinds of things that you don't don't um, encounter when you're when you're building on grade. Um, so it's, it also requires separate systems uh, for fire suppression, electric things are all connected to the platforms for safety reasons. So there's an expense there that a lot of people don't realize when they start to get involved in retail below grade. Um, there's a high cost of retrofitting. What was done on Eighth Avenue was a corridor. Uh, many of the stations that we'll talk about today, and I'm sure you have in mind, they built in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and they don't have separate water lines for, you know, to, back in 1955, a typical retail concession for a railroad was a newsstand and maybe a candy bar. 
today for a lot of those uh, concessions to survive, they need to sell a branded coffee. And when they built that stand, they didn't have a water line to it or a sewer line to it. So retrofitting can be really expensive. Clearly, all this retail is vulnerable to the transit operational environment. The priority of railroad is to run the railroad safely, um, and you're not going to take priority. And you're vulnerable to system shutdowns, being moved for new new ADA access, um, and you're vulnerable to holidays and whatever whatever weather impacts on a rail is going to impact your 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 ridership and then ultimately your 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 sales. Um, there's complications with multiple jurisdictions, particularly outside the area of New York. Uh, where you, you try to permit or entitle a particular project. Uh, maybe the railroad has one mission, uh, but the municipality that requires you to get pull a building permit or a zoning change has a different mission. And that also includes you start to compete with retail on grade. You'll get the influence of the government agency that's protecting the retailers on grade if they find you directly compete with their neighbor, you know, something that's neighboring to the station. A good example is uh, many years ago, the MTA had a uh, idea of, creating dry cleaners along the Metro North line. And it, it was fought because you had dry cleaners located within the station environment and they fought and they fought the competition against it. There's uncontrollable competition when you're below grade. Uh, the perfect example is when we were in WMATA, we did a study for them to try to create retail um, in their stations below grade. But what I could not control is 10 food trucks being stationed at grade that we didn't, that we had no jurisdiction over uh, and uh, to compete directly with the concessions that we hope to plan. John, if you could just flip it. You know, I, I'm sorry, maybe a badly colored slide, but you know, I think what's important I'm trying to point out here is 25 to 30 years ago, public agencies in general woke up to the fact that they had real estate portfolios other than for their operational uses and wanted to monetize those assets. And the kinds of holdings that public agencies and transit agencies have is really diverse. They range from a newsstand to a, to a boat dock. And you just, you know, when we talk about trying to retrofit for retail, there's just a lot of different opportunities uh, when you're in transit agencies to use different uses, particularly trying to reflect the markets we have today. Uh, go ahead, John, and make make that uh, flip. Types of retail, everything from mixed use to concessions. Uh, what you see in the one with, uh, we're using a lot of vending machine options now uh, because they don't need to be manned. They don't have to have problems with the weather. John, go ahead and flip. Uh, again, why why do you get involved? Why do you look for a transit site as opposed to an on-grade location? You have a reliable traffic pattern, right, with reliable times. Uh, there's a station environment that attracts people to it, and there's a station environment that attracts the type of sales and uses you might want. And one of the important things that I really need to emphasize today, and I hope it'll cover some of the questions that we have today, is it, there's dwell time. And, you know, whether you are arriving to uh, – go ahead and flip that slide, John. Whether you're arriving to the train station for the uh, 805 or you're at an airport, your dwell time is different. And, and here, basically, when I'm always asked, why can't I have the white tablecloth restaurant you know, at the particular train station? That's because at the 805, you arrive at 755, you have your train, you leave. So you're really looking more for a grab and go item or a convenience. When you're at the airport, I have you captured there for about two hours. So that's going to definitely, the dwell time is going to drive. Uh, the type of retail you can offer. Uh, we would, when we did studies at both Marta and Wamada, we timed the length of time passengers went from grade level through the escalators down to the platform, and it was well under five minutes for your typical subway station. So you, you really had to have a convenience item because you certainly weren't going to arrive 10 minutes before the train and then decide to have a cup of coffee. Go ahead and flip that slide. Uh, Susan mentioned the problems with uh, ridership post COVID. And these are numbers taken just this uh, past spring, and uh, the source is APTA. And you can see a substantial reduction in ridership, which is, you know, directly related to uh, potential sales. And frankly, many uh, locations, uh, whether they're in a SEPTA system or the MTA system, particularly on the outskirts of the systems itself, are receiving such a decline in ridership that it's having a direct impact on what can be offered on some of the stations. Everybody hoped for it to come back. And, you know, a, a lot of people who are developing are looking in the long term. But there's a reality that until right it comes back, you can only sustain certain things. And I think that's where we have for slides, John, and I can turn it over now to Laura. Thank you. If you don't mind flipping to the next one, um, some great stuff to build off of. So thank you. I wanted to just zoom out slightly. Um, 
to focus on the retail piece. I'm probably the least expert on transit here, but very much focused on retail. And obviously the intersection is something we spend time on. Um, Susan, you mentioned um, something I think really thoughtful, the idea of thinking about merchandising with tenants that best serve riders. And I completely agree. I also think that that if you do that right and you focus on the tenants that will best serve riders, you will ultimately end up with the most productive tenants in, in general, not on not in every case. Um, but for retail health, and this is often misunderstood, it's all about sales volumes with some limited exceptions. So if you find the right tenant that's going to do the right sales, they will be healthy and easily can argue that those things are much more important than the security or credit mechanism in general. And we can don't need to go into the weeds on deal structure, although I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but it's really about selecting those right tenants and the right synergy of tenants that will will really do great work together. You, um, Charlie talked about dwell time, which is so important, and thinking about the types of tenants that will actually serve that, um, you know, so that you can kind of get that quick piece. When we think about what's happening in general in retail and those trends that actually would impact transit-oriented retail, um, one retail as a service. There are far more retailers that are used to having landlords in certain cases or many cases and more competitively so turnkey and deliver space for them. Retailers, especially locals, which are often the tenants that we would want to populate these projects are not in, don't have the bandwidth and it's not as efficient for them to go and raise all the money manage a construction project and all of that. So that's something to contend with. And I recognize that that's not always an easy proposition with the way that a lot of the agencies are structured. So it's a friction point. Um, you know, a lot of those tenants appetites for, for capital and risk have changed. And the sort of landlord story has become far more important. So the more that a tenant can understand what that relationship will really look like, the more they are likely to come in and trust and have a really kind of a creative relationship. If you don't mind flipping on, John, thank you. So a few other trends to hit on. We've all been talking about inflation and the savings rate now for two years. But just to, to say, you know, thinking about the kinds of tenants that we're all still spending money on, there's a huge misconception that retail is dying because of the Internet or whatever. We had a pull forward during COVID where you had some Internet sales pull. But if you look at the trend line, we're still where we were going to be if that trend line had continued pre-COVID. So it's just, it's completely overblown. And I see it in, in news articles all the time as though it's a given that the internet has somehow killed retail. It hasn't, it's changed it and changed it for the better in many ways, made it healthier. Um, and obviously transit oriented retail and retail and trans transit centers is more immune to that because you've got a captive audience that needs something, a service, a product that's right there and, and captive to buy. Mm -hmm. Um, in many, many markets, especially urban markets, um, labor and construction have become massively challenging um, in regard to getting in the way of getting deals done. Not just the actual, you know, of course, construction and labor piece around getting up and going, but then the actual operations. And that's very much changed the appetite these tenants have for rent. Um, Consumerization, I think, is unrelated to the, the last few, but just an interesting trend we're seeing around things like medical and others and fitness that used to be um, a bit more commodity and, and less friendly that are becoming more kind of pop and consumer oriented and friendly, um, user friendly, which is great. And then one other thing, and Susan, you, you hit on this also in, in another way, but um, a trend that we're enjoying seeing is inclusivity and agency leasing. When you think and look at the people who are often selecting tenants, the people who are in a position to be doing the leasing, um, it's not necessarily representative of the pool of tenants or the consumers that want to patronize those tenants, especially in some of the projects we're talking about. And so taking a step back and thinking really big picture about who the team is reaching out to and often with good intentions, but just making sure that there's a broader range. With a broader range, not always, but often comes with tenants that might need a little bit more support because it's their first business and, and having the understanding of what that infrastructure looks like and being ready to do it if you're engaging in those conversations and can create some of the best, most vibrant retail. And ultimately, it can also lead to retail that has the highest volumes and can be most economically accretive. We can mosey on to the next. 
Um, and won't dwell here, but just clearly there's some projects that have been very successful, both because of the transit or unrelated to the ferry building in San Francisco, which are the first two uh, images here. These are uh, post COVID images. Uh, it was just at, at ULI, Union Station in Toronto is another really vibrant project. The amount of eventing and activation that they described putting forward make a significant difference. A lot of the people visiting when I was there were coming from downtown to grab lunch and we're not actually enjoying the transit. So further boosting revenue. We can pop one more slide. Obviously some room for improvement. Uh, first image, first three images are the Transbay Transit Center here in San Francisco um, that is hopefully at some point gonna have connectivity to some trains. Right now it is a two and a half billion dollar bus station. Um, there is some good activity on the retail that is starting to populate the outside, um, but it's under underused so far. And then Union Station in DC on the far right, um, which is seeing a bit of challenge and lack of activation and activity, but I'm hopeful. Then the last one, and I'll just make one last little point here. Um, there are a lot of smart people who spend time stepping back before retail is created or once it's created, it just needs some more attention on thinking through what is required in terms of infrastructure, how to think about merchandising to make sure that what is built and created is actually leasable in the end. And anytime you're embarking on a project like this or involved, I would highly encourage making sure there's a step back and some real thought about what that retail is actually going to look like so that it can be successful and vibrant. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, Laura and Susan and Charlie. Uh, we could turn off the slides now. And let me, let me start with asking a question, just clarifying, Laura, you were saying internet did not kill retail, and but it made it for the better. Could you say, tell us like how retail is different than it was, let's say 10 years ago, and when transit agencies and others think about retail, they need to think about it differently? So the... Internet essentially killed commodity retail or changed commodity retail, I should say, it didn't kill it. A vast misunderstanding is that it's just easy and cheap to sell online. Because of subsidized shipping and the cost of reverse logistics, meaning returning an item, it's actually incredibly expensive and tough on margins to sell an item online. A lot of these great digitally native brands, <clears throat> so brands that started on the internet, you know, Allbirds, Warby Parker, um, they are, um, you know, not those in particular, but many brands of their ilk. It's a, it can be 50 or $80 of acquisition costs online to get that customer to come into the store. It's incredible, or excuse me, to, to make a purchase online. It's incredibly expensive. It's, it's, it's big marketing. So the point is, once you do that, there's, um, there is a quite a bit of time to then kind of, uh, make that customer economically creative. A lot of those brands started because it was really cheap to target on Facebook with ads and very productive. So just to say there was a whole birth from that, which is great. Um, I think one other point that's important, maybe before I tie it back to the end of your question, um, one of the reasons why like the malls, for example, are really dying, doesn't really have as much to do with the internet. It has more to do with the fact that power centers and strip centers and all these other kinds of retail started to cannibalize the department store and a lot of the other things that were more anchoring the mall. We weren't having an increase in demand in retail, but we had an extraordinary boom of more construction and more retail being added. Um, and in many markets, we are vastly over retailed. I would argue that sort of there are many markets still where we're not, and we're seeing crazy uh, examples of that nationally. But to, to get back, I think focusing purely on what people actually want to consume while they're in a center. Food and beverage is really easy. You can't cannibalize that experience online. There are a lot of services where it's easier or cheaper or makes more sense to do those in person and might still align with the kind of, you know, place that a consumer is in when they're running through a transit center. And that's a long answer. So I'll leave it there for others to chime in. I just want to challenge you, Laura and Charlie, I'm interested in your point of view on this matter. So construction costs are up. The, the, the use that you know works in transit retail, and Charlie, I think you'll agree, is food. 
I can't put a food tent. I can't build out a store for food for less than a couple of hundred thousand dollars. It just is what it is. I am going to assume, Laura, that rents are down. My rents pre my rents are at least a third less, if not more, pre pandemic. It's pretty simple. There's it goes back to Charlie's slide. There's fewer people riding. There's fewer people in urban areas. People are working remotely. Uh, it, imp it impacts transit retail. It impacts uh, transit. So I don't see that. So we all know that my mom and pops, and they are for one of the things I find most inspiring is retail in general is a path to wealth creation for individuals. And then I have stores where it started with nothing and pre-pandemic they were selling $100,000 a month and now they're lucky if they sell $40,000 a month. And that means they aren't making money given their costs. So where's the optimism coming from? And what do you do to counter those trends? Um, and I'm that's a question for both of you. Charlie, do you want to start? You know, let me take a shot. At it. I mean, the optimism comes from the direct path that your customers are leading to a particular location. I mean, you know, whether whether it's advertising or dry or food retail, you know, it's predictable. Uh, uh, we, as you know, people have patterns and in a transit system, you know, we're going to walk by and, and, and then you can gauge your your uh, your offerings to that particular traffic in terms of how long they're passing by and what the needs are, as opposed to any street corner where you you might have to sit out there with your counters to figure out what the traffic flow is. One thing that I think was a positive, if there's positive uh, impacts from COVID, was my ability to sell to transit clients uh, the idea that they should use percentage rent, which they were all, you know, they were public agencies. So it's meant paperwork and every public agency, no matter who it is, is allergic to paper. It's auditable. They can make mistakes. So it was really hard to sell large transit agencies and the idea that it's worth the investment in the accounting because we might have less people fail. And I think, and in and the process, I think, Laura, you agree, the difficulty of public agencies using, using these RFP processes to select tenants doesn't allow a broker to do their job in terms of negotiating. And Sue had made the point that she's able to take people who have less, you know, not on the highest uh, bid, but maybe for the particular offering. And sure, there's ways to uh, maneuver an RFP to, to, to get the things you want in the site, but it's not the flexibility that a broker has to negotiate directly for what they want. But I will tell you, I, to a client that I have, we've been able to move people over to percentage rent. This way, people would go out and take a risk on a site that they might not otherwise be able to take a risk. And the sell to the agency, of course, is if things don't work out and you have to go restructure a rent, you know, you don't have to do it if you have, you don't have to go back to your board and say why you failed. You know, you either, you either all hit well, you know, or if, it, if, if unfortunately the site's not doing well, it automatically adjusts and you're not going, you're not running back to your board. I think in certain locations, Sue, that transit locations offer an alternative to where there's, where there's hot retail markets and you can't afford to be on a street anymore. Um, an example we ha I have is I'm looking really strongly out on the east end of Long Island where there's pockets of real strength and you can't even enter onto certain main, street, main streets. South Fork of Long Island, for example, but you have rail stations as, as an alternative you know, where, where the rents would come in a little bit cheaper and you have people who might take a, a shot at a different kind of opportunity. So I think the optimism is, first of all, on the hope that everything returns and starts to return. Re transit retail does not buck trends of on-grade retail. You know, in, in, in New York City, which I'm most familiar with, it, it's a disaster. We have vacancies because of the lack of office workers. That's directly the people who are taking the trains. You see pockets of strength. And, and Laura, I'm sure you see it out in California, too, where there are neighborhoods around the central business district that are that are that have an advantage because people are working from home and sticking into those neighborhoods. Retail in the five boroughs, in the four boroughs outside of Manhattan can be a little bit stronger than actually Manhattan right now because people are sitting at home and working from home. I think there's optimism, uh, and I think that's what where the optimism comes from, Sue. Okay. Thank uh, you. I think the percentage. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, I, I wanted to get on to some more questions here. Um, so somebody from Pittsburgh asked, um, can you think of any successful examples of transit retail 
in a midsize or smaller metropolitan area? Because in, in Pittsburgh, it's apparently harder to relate this to San Francisco and New York. Boston has some best pocket retail. So if you go into the Cambridge station, there's three or four stores. I'm curious other Laura, I mean, stores tend to be smaller, but some of the new uses are all over the T. Um, there's not yet medical or dental. There was COVID testing, but that kind of service retail, uh, I saw all over that market. Um, and I think that's the primary. And, and, and I, not, I don't know about Chicago, Laura. Uh, do you have any, no, do you know? I'm thinking through Chicago, Philly, DC. So, I'm so, struggling to know if it's a good example. Maybe Philadelphia. Philadelphia, which I mean, I know the folks in Pittsburgh might not want to hear it, but Philly has some good has some good locations. You have Suburban Station, and you have uh, 69th Street Station out towards the western part of the city, which has maybe eight stores, and it's it's um, multimodal with a bus route and train, so that supports a a good amount of retail. I think they could rearrange that so it goes out to the community a little bit better, and even the Frankfurt Transit Station. Uh, rather small station on the northeast part of Philadelphia supports a Dunkin' Donuts and a grab and go, and potentially a bank branch one day or, or, or medical use. So, I, I, your folks out in the Iron City just have to look over to the city, brotherly love, for an example. <laughs> New, Jersey, New Jersey Transit also has, depending upon where the location is, a sure. lot of great, even Newark, frankly. Hmm. Uh, because of the way it's laid out. Uh, you know, a lot of this has to do with the layout and whether, but I'm going to turn this around, which is we keep looking from the point of view of the retailer, from the point of view of the transit agency, it's a way to bring in 30 third party dollars and to give your riders a little pop, a little pep, a little pick it up for the kids on their way home from work. Um, and they have they have to go to the office three days a week, or just I find the teen market, you know, the eighteen to twenty four year olds, they love transit retail, so it does draw riders, and riders are what are the fare box, and it's a lot more revenue ultimately than you know percentage rent on my hot dogs. So here's an, another question. Um, it relates to safety. Um, and how safety has been addressed. This is both for retail tenants and their shops and for transit riders within the area. That's a great question. It's a big problem. Uh, we have 24 hour a day security. We have reached out to the MTA to give us cops. Homelessness affects it. Is it worse than on grade? I don't know. In fact, because we're, because, but on, you know, anytime a space is heated, cooled, and not full of people, you're going to have an issue. And ultimately, if I'm the transit agency, I'm probably going to try to make my operator defray, I'm going to defray the cost and try to put it out on them, which is another advantage of transit retail. Am I wrong, Charlie? No, I, it's an important issue that it's not just the MTA, but all transit agencies, whether it's CTA or, or SEPTA are facing. Uh, the disadvantage these transit agencies have is that they become the default location for transient populations and, and weather protectors. Um, and, and I think there's a bad perception. Um, I don't know that uh, if you go into downtown Manhattan that it's any more safer on grade than it is um, in our systems. Uh, but I just think, unfortunately, the way they're configured and how they're treated, and you know, almost as a shelter, sometimes as a last resort, uh, that there's a very, very bad perception. And I've seen systems uh, absolutely shut their transit station uh, terminals down because they couldn't control that kind of population. Um, and of course, that has an immediate impact on the retailers that are there. We talked about, you know, you're at the mercy of operations of a transit system. I know several transit systems that have closed off terminals. Um, during dur during the lockdown, during COVID, and it had an immediate impact. But perception of safety is so important because it drives who's going on the train. Forget the poor retailer that has to uh, protect his merchandise. It's, it, it does impact on, 
on ridership has a big impact on ridership. A lot of it's let, me, let, me, let me turn that question around. Do you think retail makes transit riders feel safer, safer and more likely to use transit if they see people around, they see shops around? Do you think it makes them feel yes. safer? Yes, without a question. Having more eyes in general is more helpful. And someone gave me a really interesting stat that I won't do perfectly now, but there's this kind of perception of kind of once you get to a certain tipping point of um, like, there's a lot of subjectivity to this, but it was interesting to hear kind of homeless population relative to the rest of the population. There's a safety factor that we just inherently kind of in our brains react to. And so the more people you can have in general, it's one of the things we're seeing an issue with in San Francisco and other cities where it's a, a lot of its perception, but there's also just a lower population in general downtown. The population of homeless has not risen in San Francisco and the though it feels a little different. Obviously, most people are safe and fine and doing their thing, but it creates it's, it creates fear. It's also one place where the public-private partnership works really well, which is the public, the transit agency probably has people on staff to deal with that population. And that's where the private operator needs to work hand in glove with the transit agency, even though the, of course, we're eyes on the street and are probably noticing before the transit agency, which is called in lots of directions. So it's a kind of a synergistic relationship. So here's a great question. It says, would, it's, it's a little related to a public private partnership, but it's a different kind of partnership. Uh, somebody said, how do community partners play into successful strategies at transit hubs? She's thinking about libraries and cultural performances or more experiential amenities for transit users. Have you guys thought about that? Um, I don't like to always lead, but I, most Charlie and Laura will testify that I like to talk. Um, yeah, retail is an event. I hire uh, musicians. The more I br I've asked people to sell Girl Scout cookies, you're absolutely right. Um, the more you involve the community, the more the safer it is, the more people enjoy it. And I'm a big proponent of it doesn't need to be fancy. Um, you know, if you have somebody playing the saxophone on uh, New York, New York, or you have um, you know, I give a free store to people who, somebody who promotes Broadway because it's fun and fun makes people stay and shop and enjoy trains. I think that was Laura's slide. I mean, people like to be in an activated place, you know, so to the extent that an activity like music activates, activates the place. Funding sources aside, you know, for, for, a, community, for a community type event, you know, it's certainly something that I would lean into. In in Boston, we do handle the uh, the pending pro the uh, performance programs for the MBTA, and they encourage it. You know, it, it does give it, it gives another set of eyes on a platform, and it does activate the space. That certainly is. I think in addition to the eyes and the people making it safer, I think that people like the general population feeling like there's more community rooting is also valuable and people will take the space more seriously. And also, I know we probably a lot of us were there for ULI, but Toronto was so impressed with the presentation we got on how many community events they do, how much population it drives through the project and how much activation they see. That unquestionably helps the retail as well. Hmm. Uh, great answers, thanks. So um, one of you mentioned uh, mom and pop shops um, and somebody asked, what should we do to lower barriers to small business entry. I'm thinking that if I'm gonna go from one station to another, I don't want all the same retail at each station. It's nice when, right, it's, it's local businesses, local flavors, local local amenities. So um, any thoughts about lowering batter, barriers for small business entry? Make it cheap. I mean, really simple. I mean, it, that's the most important barrier. And uh, that if you can make it simple, you're not gonna have credit. They're not gonna be able to put big security deposits up, mm -hmm. but you are, go you're absolutely right. Uh, that's what create, may you need to not be the same as what's at grade, that's the draw. 
And I think you will often see those tenants perform better. They will do higher top line. I spend a lot of time with capital, so not the operators, and this is often less transit retail, but the capital and the lenders, educating them on how important it is to underwrite business plan, not just balance sheet. Because you could have a Starbucks and some amazing local concept, and I probably should, I should just say a, a general national coffee shop or something. Yeah. And you have the lease with them. Of course, you're going to have better credit from the national retailer. I would bet you might have as good or better a chance of getting your rent paid by the local coffee shop if it's performing really well and their sales are good and they're good operators as you would the national. Because the national might just say, come come after me, sue me, right? And does it really make economic sense to do that? Not necessarily. We saw that happen again and again during COVID. And so there's a bit of a misconception around credit sometimes where if you really are good and pick the right tenants, you can do better. And to Susan's point earlier, make it cheaper. And that's all about build out. Tenants are less rent sensitive more it's more the upstart if they are in a hole to start they'll never i think laura makes a good point there in that if it's a transit agency asking that question the way to encourage that kind of small shop to come into your system is to, is to maybe and i think it was in one of your slides earlier laura help bring the build out at least to a vanilla box we're, we're retrofitting spaces we're dealing with utility lines and sewer lines engineers architects you know uh, fire suppression engineers to the extent that a transit agency can provide a vanilla box and allow the tenant to then complete the build out, you're probably able to attract a smaller business into that particular space. So and, here's, and I'm sorry, oh, Optim ahead. optimally, right? You give, your transit agency probably doesn't want to spend a lot of dollars on build outs. So optimally, you give your operator a long free rent period, you try to get the utilities there for them, and you acknowledge that they're going to have to put capital in in order to, and, and that capital is going to have to get a return before the transit agency. But what you're going to get back if they go bankrupt is a built out space. Right. And I'm just going to second what, so I have some fabulous tenants. I have a Venezuelan guy who makes empanadas. I had a Bolivian person whom I found in the far Rockaways, which is in the middle of nowhere, no offense, if you're all from the Rockaways, that made sultanas. I had Lisa's noodles or dumplings or whatever they are. Uh, they, people line up. So Laura is absolutely right. And uh, people have fun with them. Um, End of, end of speech. So uh, we have a question, which I think is very similar to what we were just talking about. Um, somebody from Los Angeles said they want a curated experience for Los Angeles Union Station, not something you could find at any mall or airport. How do we best do this? Bring in the best of local really thoughtfully curate. And this isn't something where you just, the space is available. To the extent that you can fit it into whatever the RFP requirements are, have someone whose job is to think carefully about what the overall merchandising plan should look like, meaning create categories and make lists within each category of the specific tenants you ideally would like to see and have someone specifically go through and try to reach out to those tenants and categories to start a conversation to make sure they're engaged. If you do that and you bring the right community of those tenants together, explain to them what the events might look like, activations, what kind of traffic you they could expect, you can do that. And to the earlier conversation, it is far more about build out than it is about rent. They're gonna care a lot less about rent if they're making money. It's not, not as much the point. It is the initial outlay of capital that is the hardest part. Uh, we went and made lists of the tenants we wanted the best tea shop, the best donut shop. The Then we tied our merchandising plan into our design and our design guidelines. So we carried that merchandising plan through to the way the place looked. And we, the transit agency, once it saw the merchandising plan, was willing to take a step back and not approve each tenant, mm -hmm. um, which helps. Right, you don't have time when you're trying to do a deal to say, "Are you happy with this one? Are you happy?" They told us what we would couldn't do, and we don't do it. 
So guess again, set out the rules, approve the design, tell the trans, tell the operator what you want, and uh, hold them accountable. So somebody asked here, how would you all address retail from the perspective of a new, but perhaps limited ridership facility? Um, and this person said maybe intercity passenger rail or a TOD development opportunity. So I guess the key there is limited riders, not a, a busy big city station. Is it different? Well, yeah, well, Phil, I go right back to some of the things we covered. The compensation structure has to be right for the limited passenger, right? So not it's not flat rent, it's percentage rent. You know, that's really as, as a starter to attract somebody in there. You know, that, that's how I, one of the easier ways is how you structure it. And I think you'd have to start to, you know, the right marketing plan with looking at, you know, it, in every train station, every particular location, it's location, 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 it's real estate, is gonna differ. Do you have competing uses across the street from a commuter rail station? Or do you lack them that you can absolutely come into uh, where you are marketing to the community as well? I mean, I could in Mount Kisco in New York, they created a great up and delicatessen. I would tell you that only 10% of the customers came from, it was called the flying pig of all things, but probably only 10% of the customers came from the commuter rail. Uh, it came from the community of Mount Kisco. They were able to, they, they saw a niche that they could fill with the products they had and they were able to open it. So uh, if you have very light ridership, I would say to you, you better hope that you can commute beyond beyond the ridership to survive. Question for Charlie. There's also. Oh, I'm sorry. How deep do you see? How deep do you see the service retail? So you know, I, I don't know whether you can have dog grooming or, uh, you know, have you seen service retail in some of these less trafficked areas work? I have seen, and I, I have seen. Uh, some specialty shops in Westchester County, all in the Metro North Area commuter line work. Um, I've seen some um, food retailers off the train station environment uh, on Long Island work. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't talk about it, but uh, you know, there's retail centers like out in Ronkakuma, Long Island, way out in Long Island, which is you know a a mini shopping station built next to the uh, the garage. So I've seen them work. Do I see a big emphasis on it lately? No, but uh, maybe that's the, maybe that's the future, Sue. You know, as as you give up on newsstands, and you know, and and just pass your amenities, where you have really have to do a better marketing plan to see what you could do to keep, compete beyond the train station. I mean, certainly Starbucks in uh, it's in Scarsdale along the Metro North Line. They, they certainly have a good big percentage of the Metro North riders, but it's serving that particular community. So, I, I think I think depending on the location. You know, and certainly if it's a lightly traveled station, you have to be able to sell beyond the passenger if you're gonna locate at that station. Laura, how deep is the service retail market? Are all these firms willing to go to out of the way locations at all? Um, they don't really have to right now because there's so many landlords competing in urban areas for tenants like that. I think my earlier comments that you wisely kind of pushed against more macro national when I was talking about how well retail is doing. It's a landlord's market in, in most of the country outside of the urban markets. But in urban markets, oh no, you've got landlords competing for tenants, all in, in many cases, multiple landlords offering full turnkey, meaning the tenant pays maybe for their fixtures and equipment and moves in. Done, that's all they do. So it's tough. Um, I think there has to be a viable, like, measurable traffic story to show that the tenant will do volume and consistent volume. And just to call out one comment that I thought was really thoughtful that was made in the chat, the idea of smaller tenant spaces. This goes back to Susan, what you were mentioning about being really thoughtful about design relative yeah. to merchandising. More spaces that are small, especially for the kind of uses we're talking about, are so important because often you've got a tenant that can monetize 500 or 800 feet the same as they would monetize 1200 or 2000 feet especially coffee which has gotten a little bit smaller so that extra 500 or 800 feet isn't necessarily generating more value you might as well in a perfect setting have an additional tenant or another offering that's really smart uh when we do our stores are all 400 feet and guess what 
when you get $6,500 a month, 400 feet, you're not doing so bad. But So that I, th I thought it was really interesting that question about smaller tenant spaces. Also, I was I wanted to pick up on that. Um, so th sometimes you go in, into sub in stations in Asia, and I've seen sort of like stands, like like people can go and they can set something up. They don't have to actually have a storefront. Is that done in in many transit stations? Sort of not. Well, if you think about like a shopping mall, sometimes you'll see a kiosk, right? Just something sort of temporary. Is that something that you encourage or discourage? It's great. Uh, frequently, the transit agency wants a storefront because of vent to, because of issues with venting, but storefronts are barriers. Uh, you're, you're missing an important variable that Charlie hit on. Our stations are old, so Seoul or Tokyo or China can do a lot of stuff that it's very, very hard to do in older environments. So it'll be really interesting uh, for the newer, you know, whether it's LA or San Francisco, to see what what variety they're able to bring because they're, they're newer build-ups. There's a question from somebody from Ohio who said that COVID wiped out their ridership and almost all of their retail. Do you have any thoughts on how to restart a retail program? Well, it's going to have to start with ridership. If you're at the if you're at the if you're at the station environment, you know it, it restarts with return of ridership. And mm -hmm. again, it's about the location. Is that is that particular location um, competitive on grade with what's across the street and into its community? If it's not, it's going to be driven on ridership. Mm -hmm. Start with pop ups. Give the space away. Uh, do Christmas things and then Thanksgiving things and make them zany and fun uh, and promote them. Promote them in the on the local listserv if you don't still have a community newspaper. Um, uh, you know, I, I did a retail plan for a suburb of New York City that had lots of empty shops and it was really dependent on taking the people who sold stuff on Etsy and having them do a pop-up market and promoting it in all of the schools. It goes back to what, what Laura said about tying into the community. And people love pops. They're flash sales. They're events. But but they're, but, but so they're also taught, they're administratively cumbersome for a public agency. Um, you know, I, I was got pushed many years ago to do farmers markets out in Newark and at different stations. You know, your your train station exists in the food desert. Can't we have a farmers market? Uh, the, the administration of a farmers market to make sure farmer Sue gets to the location on Saturday and she decides not to come. I can get on the phone to Laura to make sure her potatoes show up that Saturday. It's just a, it's an administrative uh, undertaking that you have to be careful. I mean, I know agencies like the MBTA had a small pushcart program administratively very and it had nothing to do with revenue administratively very difficult to administer it was costly uh, we i agree with you you know if you get the right pop-up you know it's a national brand it's a car dealership i think those are all fantastic ways to to activate a station but it, but to run a small business program means you have to have the manpower to do that you throw them out there they're not going to survive you're not going to like the look or the safety of it unless you have the ability to administer it and it's 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 it's, it's labor intensive you're right. Um, somebody asked about giving space away for free to community groups or cultural groups. We talked about that uh, enlivening the space before with those kinds of uh, amenities. How about are transit agencies in some places saying, okay, you could have this for free because you're doing something that's that's a has public value? Your public private partnership. If eighty percent of your stores are revenue producing, there's no reason in the world why you can't, you don't want those 20% to sit, sit empty because it hurts everybody. So uh -huh. why not give them to the local art um, school? Why not give them, as long as it doesn't cost you anything, as long as it, they can pay for their electric um, and they'll keep the lights on, it's life. Um, I, 
And I think, I mean, I'm sure when Laura does her merchandising plans, she factors in um, less, you know, community uses because they bind you back. And it's great too, because it often those uses drive unique trips and drive traffic. And so those could ultimately come back to you economically through additional revenue from your, you know, for-profit or non-community oriented. Right. And there are spaces, uh, Phil, that are currently occupied by not-for-profits at community railroads. And they could uh -huh. be, uh, they could be the basis of a community organization. Uh, there are museums that occupy several train stations uh, mm -hmm. on Long Island. Um, they, they, they are done. It's really the ability to not for profit to carry the insurance and yep. the maintenance costs of the sites too. What I wouldn't want to get involved in is, is parking a community group in there that can't maintain the site. And then all, all of a sudden I just have issues with, you know, the, the look of the site or the maintenance of the site. As long as the not for profit is able to carry the maintenance costs of it and the site does not have a great marketable use, I'm fine with that. You know, uh, and I, I, think, I think it's done. I'll give a step for, forward, step step more. It's a great brand for transit to, to say, I used to run doggy adoption, but if I'd had the AC, ASPCA in there, that's a great thing for the transit agency to show it cares. There are any of an, the United Way, if you give a space to a beloved not-for-profit in the community, you're signaling, you're, collect, you're connecting the people who live upstairs to the ridership below, and you're saying we're more than a transit agency. Uh, we're part of this community. So it's an important message. So a couple of people asked about Union Station in Washington, D.C. One of the questions was, what would you do to revive retail in the front door of the nation's capital. Are, are there, anybody here familiar with uh, Union Station? I see some heads nodding up and down. No, so, it, it's, it's an interesting thing that's happened at Union Station. And uh, Laura and Sue, I'm not sure if you agree with me, and I don't want to sponge anybody, but I wonder at that particular station, its failure was more about the operators than it was about the potential location. That's one of the few destination points. And when it was riding high, it took a lot of customers from the legislative office building in for lunch and bars. It was a great destination point. And I'll just say that that particular operator has also had trouble at on grade locations outside of the Washington DC area uh, with, with large markets that are not functioning well either. So you, I, they need a proper anchor. They need to realize what their audience is. And I think now that I listen, they certainly got hurt by COVID and the shutdown, right? When DC mm -hmm. shut down, you know, they, they were a destination point, but the office buildings were closed. So it was the lunch crowd was gone. So, you know, so I, I think careful marketing and a good market study and realizing that the LOB is is one of their big sources of customers. I think I think it can work again, but I, I'm, I'm not so sure that Union Station isn't more of an issue about how it was operated and, and other business terms that really caused that great haul. The all of a sudden, I mean, it's shocking to walk through it and find it empty for me. Well, I mean, that resonates with what I saw a few weeks ago without any necessarily like insider expert info. Um, just the, the tenants that remained were the kinds of tenants that I feel like we saw in older transit stations and airports five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and nowhere near what I've seen in some of the updated. It's just, it's not what people want to consume today. So they're just not. Would be my yeah. could you Could you clarify what you mean by um, the kinds of, products and shops that aren't necessarily what people are looking for today? So with respect for the fact that there's a wide array of people who use transit, which is one of the wonderful things about it, um, yeah. I think uses that aren't necessarily healthy, aren't necessarily super quick and are, are national. So there is very much space for those kinds of, for, for uses that are national, for uses that you know are not necessarily healthy, but there yeah. are so many great smoothie operators why have a jamba juice and i don't mean to pick on them but just the idea of like okay and it's the kind of thing you see it like you know it's kind of an older airport versus uh, think about the volume of people who do that so well that are local yeah got it okay um so we are out of time um and i just want to thank the three of you um i think it was a great discussion uh we had more questions but we couldn't get to all of them 
Um, so I just want everybody to know that they can find slides and a recording of the webinar. It's on our website, enotrans.org. Um, and anyone who signed up, who registered for the webinar, they're going to get a, a link with um, um, access to the recording of this. Um, asking everybody to sign up for our mailing list. And you can get in, gain access to our newsletter, webinar announcements, release reports, information, that sort of thing. Um, we're happy to offer our webinar series free of charge if you enjoy them. Again, check out the link in the chat box and learn about donating or becoming a member. Thanks again, Susan, Charlie, Laura, and thank you all for um, your questions. Um, and uh, all of you, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for the opportunity.